Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Peace and blessings be upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad forever. I want to speak to you today, not just from the mind or from books, but from the heart. And that is because in the early part of 2020, the world has gone through tremendous changes. With the convergence of the COVID-19 pandemic and the looming international economic recession and blatant, clear racism being displayed publicly on social media that goes throughout the world. Because they feared for their lives. American teen Michael Brown. People are feeling frustration. The youth are marching in the streets. And many individuals are, are feeling a type of frustration and sometimes even a mental breakdown. I am an African American. And I want to make it clear that both of my parents are African Americans. My mother has a Caribbean background from the island of Barbados. My father, an African American, with some roots on his mother's side with the native people of the Mohawk Nation. We were raised as African Americans in the Boston area. And from an early age, we heard the stories of my father, who was an angry man, because he had served in the United States Armed Forces in World War II. He was in the military police. And in traveling through Europe, fighting against fascism, he found racism within the ranks of the United States Army. And because of this, he brought back these stories of inequality. He brought back the stories of a type of ideology, a type of racism, a white supremacy. And we have to remember now that when we talk about racism, we are talking about that phenomenon that has three major manifestations. Racism is based on an ideology, a set of beliefs and understanding that one group is superior to another. This ideology then manifests itself through racist behavior. That is where the racist names come in, the insults, the arrogance, the, the different wrong behavioral patterns. And then finally it manifests itself in a structural way in institutions. So there's three parts. There's an ideology that's the basis of racism. There are racist insults and behavior, but the institution is the one that maintains it and that really uh, causes mass confusion within society. Let's set the record straight. When we look at the phenomena of Western society, of the Americas, and I talk about Canada, US, Central America, Caribbean, South America, even when we look at Europe in terms of the Atlantic slave trade, we have to recognize that from the 15th century going on, for over 400 years, a vicious program of slavery was set up, a type of triangle that began with the European planters and merchants who invested in the boats. They went to Africa and they captured African people, slaves, political prisoners, took them to the Americas, to the plantations where the cash crops, the tobacco, the sugar cane, the cotton was grown and then the products sent back to Europe. So a vicious triangle that enriched the white bourgeois society and also helped Europe and later America go through an industrial revolution. And so we're talking about a vicious system where millions of African people were stripped of their homeland taken through a terrible middle passage in the Atlantic, stuffed together in slave boats, brought into the colonies, 
in Canada, US, Caribbean, and South America, tortured, brutalized, and then the system maintained itself. And so we need to look at this as a process to understand what is going on because people, when they saw George Floyd shouting, I can't breathe, when the white policeman put his knee on his neck and snuffed out his life, people started saying, I can't breathe. But they didn't realize that when the black people of the Americas, these are black people who are descendants of the African people of the Atlantic slave trade, when black people shout, I can't breathe, it's not breathing physically, economically, socially, politically, and even spiritually. So this is a very serious issue when you are talking about not being able to breathe. It is based upon an, an uncut thread of white supremacy where the European people established a system of exploitation based upon the superiority of Europeans over people of color and especially African people. When they first came to the colonies, they tried to enslave the poor whites, but that didn't work because they were white as well and sometimes had the same family name, so they had upward mobility. Then they tried to enslave the native population, the First Nation, but that didn't work either because in many cases, the native people would just sit down or when they got a chance, they run away and that's their land. And so they looked to Africa for an easily identifiable group of people who had good skills in farming and producing in tropical type climates, who had good knowledge based upon their society and could be easily uh, found because of their color or their language or, or, or their traditions. And they brought them in large numbers. And so the terrible part about this thread that begins with the brutal capture of the people is the fact that especially in the United States, it became an institution. And that is because in the, in the Constitution of the United States, and we go back to 1776, and the, the, the US 13 colonies forming themselves, it was stated that the African slave was three-fifths of a man. And many people do not realize that Thomas Jefferson, President of the United States, had slaves. And when he was passing away, he wrote his will and he didn't free the slaves. So the subjugation of African people to maintain this brutality was systematic. It wasn't isolated. And slave codes were written. They were written in the North, the Code Noir in French, in the colonies. And in these codes, anybody who was a person of African descent, whether you were originally free or captured, you became a slave. And so the color line was developed. And this terrible system enslaved people for hundreds of years. But the African people that we are now calling black people, the descendants of the slaves, did not sit down. They revolted in Africa. They revolted and rebelled and jumped off the boats in the middle passage of the Atlantic. They revolted in the colonies. And because of a series of traumatic uh, occasions for the Europeans, when rebellions broke out, whites were being killed. And then abolitionists coming up, black abolitionists and white abolitionists, who were struggling to abolish slavery. When these two movements converged, there was nothing left but to end this cruel system. And so slavery was going through its final stages when it broke out in a war in the United States called the Civil War. And this is between 1861 and 1865. But in 1863, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, wrote the Emancipation Proclamation. 
talking about the freedom of the slave, but it wasn't until 1865 when the 13th Amendment uh, was passed that the slaves were actually free. So this terrible war that took over 750,000 lives, it wasn't just a struggle for the freedom and emancipation of the slaves, it was to bring the Union back together so that the North and the South would stay as one Union. Slavery was one of those reasons for it, but it was not the primary reason for this terrible war. Slavery then was abolished and a system of reconstruction developed. And this reconstruction period, basically between 1865 and 1877, was a time when black people would be given, according to the books, 40 acres and a mule, and reconstruction of society would happen. People would be freed, people would be educated, people would be reintegrated back into American society. But how can you do that when your language was taken away, your culture was taken away, your, your spirituality was taken away? Generations of parents were separated, and so people didn't know where to go. They ended up working on the same land. But Reconstruction continued, and, and many of the white intellectuals came down into the South. But the, but the white planters, the Confederacy, the white supremacy ideologues fought back. This was a type of white rage which expressed itself, especially in the South. And in 1866, the Ku Klux Klan was formed. This terrorist organization was, was, was put together in order to uh, put terror into the hearts of the African people, to break down any progress that came through Reconstruction. And so the struggle went on with the North and the South, and because the Union had to be preserved, the Southerners actually began to take power in the government of the United States. And so whether they were able to pass laws or not, a series of state-based laws called the Jim Crow laws were enacted throughout the South. And this Jim Crow system that went from the 1860s all the way, or the 1880s, all the way to the 1960s. These Jim Crow laws actually uh, put together a type of apartheid system where people were legally separated. And you'll be surprised to know, and especially for those who are new on the shores of the Americas, you might not understand what America really is or what Canada really is or what the Caribbean islands really are. But to use the example of America, which is the clearest and best recorded example, the Jim Crow apartheid laws made racism legal. And so white and colored, meaning black people, people of descendants of the slaves, could not go in the same toilet. You could not eat at the same restaurant. You could not sit in the same bus in the same position. Blacks had to be in the back. It even affected morgues, cemeteries, churches, all aspects of life. There was no marriage between white and black. It was against the law. And even in talking to a white person, you had to sort of look down and the white had the right to beat you, to torture you, and even public lynchings were carried on. Like you go out to a fanfare or you go to a football game. Public lynches where hundreds of people would come out, white people, come out to see a black man or a black woman strung up and hung to death. And there are cases of a black woman who is strung up, burnt to death. Her child is ripped out of her stomach in front of the people that included their children. This is white rage, which is the defender of white supremacy. And white supremacy, yes, it is born out of hatred and ignorance. And fear is its father and isolation is its mother, but the danger of white supremacy is when it becomes institutionalized. So the Jim Crow laws continued until in the 50s and 60s, civil rights struggles broke out. African people, black people then took to the streets with their supporters in order to bring forth a peaceful revolution, peaceful protesting, in order to get uh, voting rights, education rights, desegregation, and the civil rights led by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and other uh, great leaders uh, carried this through the streets, especially of the South.
And the civil rights struggle was able to get certain acts, the civil rights acts that were enacted by the United States government, giving voting and, and giving education. But white rage came back. And so we find the clans coming back in. We find the Black Wall Street, you hear about Tulsa, Oklahoma, that had probably the, the, the greatest manifestation of black progress that was coming up. And you find this is being destroyed in the 20th century, mobs coming down, bombing and burning over 35 blocks of uh, black establishments. People who had raised themselves up, the American dream, destroyed by white rage. And so out of this, a rebellion happened in the 60s. The, the people took to the streets, especially the youth and the Vietnam veterans coming back. Because you have to remember that Martin Luther King identified three great ills. He identified poverty, racism, and militarism. Think of those three things. This is just before he was assassinated. A rebellion took place. Malcolm X, al Haj Malik Shabazz, was able to crystallize the concepts of the human rights violations, to crystallize the concepts of the ballot or the bullet. And so rebellion broke out in the streets. And in reaction to this, a counterinsurgency program was unleashed by the United States government. And this is well known and public and documented. Drugs broke out and were, 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 were allowed to come into the black communities. First, of course, the heroin and the cocaine and the marijuana, but then crack cocaine was developed in a laboratory, a cheap form of cocaine that could be easily distributed and makes you addicted with a small amount. And then the war on drugs. And so through the government, for minor offenses with drugs, a person becomes a felon for life. And you, what literally developed was a type of mass incarceration where stop and frisk was going on and, and, and people of African descent, also Hispanic and also uh, Native Americans, were stopped and frisked. And, and the prisons then were filled with people of color. For African people, for black people, unended thread of white supremacy. And so from the 70s and 80s and 90s, even going into, into the 21st century, we find that the United States has the highest level of incarceration in the world. Proportionately, there were more people, more African people incarcerated in the United States. This is in 2020s than in South Africa at the height of apartheid. Mass incarceration. And even though a black president was elected, it didn't affect much on the ground. The unbroken thread of white supremacy continued through the society, causing confusion. And then remember what Martin Luther King said. He spoke about militarism. The war came inside the United States. The police departments that were originally slave raiding groups they turned into militaries. And you see that the United States, that the New York Police Department has a, has a larger budget than most of the militaries of the world. And so as Martin Luther King said, militarism, racism, right? He identified these ills that would happen in the societies. And so this manifestation of racism, we have to recognize it didn't happen just in the United States. It also happened in Canada. Canada, being a British colony, did not have such blatant laws. They did not have such open Ku Klux Klan societies. But ca the Canadians, early Canadians as British colonists, French colonists, they had slaves. There were slave revolts. Some slaves escaped Canada and ran to the United States. But because the British had a different way of doing things, they were more polite with their slavery. It was mainly a domestic slavery, in some cases farm slavery. And when you go to Nova Scotia, you'll see some terrible manifestations of brutality and slavery. 
but for the most part, it was a type of a, a rotten slavery without smell to it. Whereas in the United States, it was rotten and it stinks. And so the Canadian slavery, the Canadian racism, developed right along and right up into the 50s and 60s, the highest level of employment for most black males would be a red cap uh, on a train or a musician, an entertainer. The women were, for the most part, domestics. You very rarely saw any black person in politics or, or in high level business or society. And so when the civil rights movement developed, and came about, it was embraced by black people in Canada. It was embraced and strengthened by black people in the Caribbean, especially Jamaica, with Marcus Garvey and, and, and many of the great leaders, also Guyana and Trinidad. And you'll see the, the movement leaders are coming from all of these areas for the civil rights that turned into this rebellion against white supremacy. And then George Floyd said, I can't breathe. Everybody now wants to talk about racism. People want to know what is this about? And the strange phenomena that I want to emphasize is that many of us who were involved in the struggle in the 60s, we realized that anarchy is not enough. That on the streets, angry is not enough. We had to organize. And then we recognized that if we wanted only an economic revolution, it's not a complete revolution. We needed a total revolving, a total revolution, a transformation, a way of life. And so we embraced Islam because Islam represents an alternative society that functioned before capitalism and socialism, an, al an alternative society of which many of our grandparents one third of the African slaves and political prisoners brought to the Americas were Muslims. So this was part of our culture. So here is a package, a way of life that we could grab onto, giving us a worldview, a liberated spirituality, a, a way to break down color, a, a way to break down oppression. It, it, it appeared to be a package. And we fled into the Muslim community that was coming into the Americas as immigrants in the 19th and 20th century, then 21st century, economic migration coming into the Americas and forming Islamic centers. And so we took refuge in the Islamic centers and the masjid. Yes, we did have a manifestation coming out of black nationalism in America with the Morris Science Temple of the World, with the Nation of Islam. We also had uh, Sunni groups, the Orthodox Ahl Sunnah, amongst African Americans that developed. But the, the largest manifestation coming into the 70s, 80s, 90s was the immigrant based Islamic centers. And so we took refuge in the centers. But the immigrants, the Muslims who were coming from the Muslim world, in many cases they were escaping poverty, they were escaping repression. They were escaping brutality and they found a type of freedom in the United States, in Canada, uh, and South America, and the Caribbean. They found some kind of freedom. Even when they came to the UK, when they came to France, they, they found this freedom. And so they uh, took on, in many cases, the, the body language and the mindset of their master, thinking that this was a way to escape their own personal persecution but not knowing that they were taking on the attitude of white supremacy, which delegated African people or relegated African people to the bottom. And it considered the only value that we had is it was in our voices or in our bodies. And so black people would come into the masjid and they would see the brother and they say, okay, brother, call the Adhan. You make the call to prayer. You are our Bilal. And we know that Sayyidina Bilal, radiallahu anh, was a, a, a great companion of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, but his position was, was, was reduced to a call to prayer made by a black person. And so they said to the black brother, call the Adhan. Or they said, do security, because they knew that we were in good physical shape. And, and this is the, the, the stereotype of black people, good fighters, good athletes, 
So call the Adhan and do the security. The black sister, you can sweep the floor and you can cook the food and you can be part of the auxiliary force. But you very rarely would see a, a black African uh, sister teaching the classes or as a scholar or in any position of authority within the community. And so what was developing in these centers was what I call a type of structural prejudice. It is not racism in the classical sense because it can't have an ideology because within Islam, within the Quran and the way of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, racism is finished. So people will say, well, there is no racism in Islam. And yes, there's no overriding ideology, but people carry their attitudes. They carry a type of class system based on the caste system of India and Pakistan. They carry manifestations. Remember racism now, the ideology and the behavior. So there's no, there's no ideology ruling over the centers, but the behavior comes in. And so black people push to the side negative attitudes coming in and feeling unwanted and then the words come out and I speak Arabic and I know that the word abd meaning slave is used in many Arabic uh, vernaculars to describe African people or zinji or takruni or zift or whatever it may be and in Somali too adon which is used to describe uh, the Bantu Africans okay so these attitudes coming in looking down on black people, making people of color, especially uh, the black Muslims, descendants of the African slave trade, to, to make us feel like a type of second class. It is real. And now it is coming to the surface. And when black people in, a, in the Islamic community say, I can't breathe, this is what they're talking about. And in leadership, it was very rare to see an African-American, a black Muslim male to rise to, to the position of Imam. And those who did go for Islamic education, they had to be twice as good as, as the other students, especially a white Muslim. And I say this with all respects to, to those European Muslims who sincerely embraced Islam. But when a white Muslim would come into our communities, immediately put him up, let him teach. Let him be on the executive committee because the, the low self-esteem that, uh, that, that Muslims coming into the white supremacy system inherited gave that person a position of power without having the knowledge or actually having the authority or the ability. And so very rarely was a black person put in that position. And I, even in Islamic universities, in Arabia can remember it being said when one teacher uh, was talking, this, this is now a so-called scholar, talking to another one and uh, I and others were within hearing distance and they said, what about those, uh, uh, those black people who are raising up? I mean, who are they? They're going up into the college. No Americans have ever gone this. And the other uh, teacher said to his friend, these are not the real Americans. So he was speaking about black people, see? They're not the real Americans, because the real Americans are the white Americans. This is the, the filth of white supremacy that manifests itself even within the Islamic society, not in a structural sense, not systemic in the same way as we, you control a society, but being prejudicial, causing bias, harming our children, the attitudes of teachers teaching the class, what is a good student, what is a bad student, the, 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 the low self-esteem it gives people of color, that beautiful is having light skin or having straight hair. All of these issues affect our community and it's time for us to speak out about it. It's time for us to confront this because as black people coming out of the rebellions of the West, we looked at Islam as a package. And it still is a package. It still is there. The Quran is still there. The Sunnah, the way of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is still there. How they broke down color, how they broke down this, this negative stereotyping. It is still there for us. The examples are there. But somebody has to live Islam. Somebody has to manifest this way of life 
in reality within the Islamic centers and be involved in the struggle in the streets, be involved in some way to bring down the systemic racism within the Western societies. This is a dilemma now that I'm talking about. And many black Muslims are caught between systemic racism in the society and structural prejudice in the Islamic centers. This is a dilemma. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that we turn to. Our faith is there, our lifestyle is there, and we are willing to go forward. And we pray that Muslims will face this, deal with the demons inside of themselves, the demons of racism, of caste system, of tribalism, and come together in the true spirit of the early Muslims who work side by side and did not judge a person on the basis of the color or judge a person on whether he was an Arab or a non-Arab. That is our potential and that is our prayer. So I leave you with these thoughts and I pray that Almighty Allah would help this society to come out of the pandemics, physical and spiritual. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would revive Islam in the hearts of the Muslims and help us to give this to the society as a solution to white supremacy and the devilish concept of the superiority of one person over another. I leave you with these thoughts. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.